what is something that made you smile today? And that's what Amanda Spiritu would say, the guest for our episode. Amanda Spiritu is someone whose last name speaks for itself. She is a spirit, a free spirit, a person creatively surrendering to her own arts, to her own form, to her own expression. She is a global resident, a world traveler, a founder of Creator Surrender Studios, and the author, a, a first time now author of Creative, Surren Creative Surrender, the book, how she is creatively surrendering and becoming the best version of herself, accepting herself in her own way. And there's something to take from this, whether it be you're in a good place or an even better place. Please open yourself up. And as I was affected in this way, I was opened up. My perspective was changed from this conversation. And I appreciate you tuning in nonetheless. So enjoy this one with Amanda Espiritu as she opens us up to her world. I'll see you soon. I have a dream. That's one small step for man. I am the greatest. You want something? Go get it. Period. Amanda Kelly Espiritu, right? Well, yep. So I'm so excited. I have so many different things I want to ask you today, but I really want us to dive deep and there's so many different reasons to, but in a three bullet intro, uh, to start off, you are the founding member, global director of Stages Arts. You yep. are the founder of Creative Surrender Studios, which we'll get into a ton. And then you're the host of Ted Circle or a Ted Circle's host at Ted which I never even knew was a thing. So that's awesome. But <laughs> gratitude, thank you for being here today. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, for the last one, TED Circles is just over a year old. So that entire initiative that TED's been putting on is pretty new, but I'm excited to be part of it. Wow, okay, I never knew. Wow. Mm -hmm. and, and just like you uh, inspired me to do, I want to ask you the question you ask others of what made you smile or laugh today? <laughs> um, so I'm actually like home alone right now. My parents went out to Ohio and my sister is up with friends, um, out of the city. And so I've just been dancing around the house, uh, for a few hours now, uh, which has been super, super fun. I went, did errands this morning and I was like, I just need to have like something for me to just get some movement out and some energy because I didn't do it first thing this morning. So instead of just dancing around my room or in the basement, I have the whole house and that freedom has been incredible. So yeah, definitely that. I was just laughing at myself. <laughs> That's awesome. Nothing like being alone, dancing, uh, blasting music. I love it. And what about you, Anthony? Uh, for me, I would say, uh, my my grandfather sneezes really loud, so uh, <laughs> there was a couple of times that he did that today. I was just laughing, and uh, I think something to smile. I would say I, I when I did have another uh, understanding on like a self level uh, when I watched this one thing today, that helped me push me forward into making steps to where I want to go. I was like, I just like those moments. I, I'm big on the the realizations when I get over something or get over a hump to get to something else. Um, yeah. And, and I really want to, cause as of recently, um, and we talked about this before recording, you posted something on Facebook and Instagram of, I, and this is just creative surrender in general. Like you, you really are uh, epitomizing that you embody that. And I would love to read a snippet of what you posted and then have you get into uh, that and, and the topic of it, but posted on Facebook, Instagram, social, reciting from uh, your post. It was around suicide prevention in your story. And there was one part towards the end where you said, the dark parts of myself that like to play in the shadows made me who I am today. And I wouldn't have traveled the world nearly as far without facing myself head on and sharing more openly because it's made others feel seen and safe to do the same. I love who I am today, and I love those I have around me. And that caught my eye. I was like, that's, that's awesome. And I, I would love to have you open up about that in like sort of a open-ended way, even though I, I will reference the post, I'll put it in the description, but just your, your journey with that, and, and then we can dive really deep. 
Sure. Um, thanks. Um, I'm glad that it's resonated with so many people. I was definitely a little more than nervous to be posting it. Um, while there are definitely a lot of friends and family members or people I've met over the years who I've gotten to be a lot more open with in, in telling the story and more comfortable, I don't think it is ever something that I have posted so publicly that, you know, it's it's a bit intimidating sometimes when so many things on the internet kind of live forever. But I also have been thinking a lot over the years about the masks that we all sort of wear and how in such a time during this pandemic, right, where we're all so disconnected and not able to see each other, where do you kind of go to find that sort of intimacy? Where are you going to be real? And, you know, I, I never want anything that I'm doing to be something that's performative. Like I always try to go in intentionally of like, you know, before I post this, like, what am I trying to get out of it? What is my purpose behind this? And I know for me, when I've been telling my story to people just by word of mouth, it's stuff that really resonates with them, even if it's, you know, not everyone will ever understand 100% what anyone else is going through. I think there's a really cool testament to really div like digging deep into where there have been failures and where things aren't always sort of sunshine and rainbows, because that's not really real life. And the amount of things that are so edited on social media and so perfected that's not really like real life and so i'd rather be i guess like as authentic and genuine as possible in anything i'm going about particularly with my relationships and so part of it i think has been in the past uh year i'd say really coming to recognize like how far i've come but also realizing that you know i fought to be super super independent um, being the eldest of five, going and doing all these things, juggling 12 things at once, I've really come to recognize that I go so much farther when I'm really in community with people, um, which is always what I set out to do, is to really connect people more to each other, regardless of the language barriers or the country of origin they might be from. I think like everyone has a really cool story to tell. And so I try to, I guess my leadership style is like leading by example. And so it would be super hypocritical of me to be asking people to be really vulnerable with me if I'm not doing the same. And so putting that out there very publicly, I knew that there were some people who have told me that I guess like it's, it's brave in a way. And I guess it is, but it's more just, you know, I figured out how to I guess, come to love myself and forgive and heal myself and the importance of that. Because as, uh, as a kid, and the, the time I was referencing my sophomore, junior year of high school when I was 15, um, that was a really, really difficult time. And part of it I've identified over the years is because I always operate on this default of trying to fix everything for everyone. And it's not that I think that I'm completely worthless, but I've always operated under the assumption that people around me, my family, my friends are worth a lot more. And so that disconnect was something that I really had to, to work through because I've, I've come to see uh, as I've gone about life in general, that if I take care of myself, I'm able to help 10 times as many people. And so, you know, getting into some of what those failures are on what that journey really is, that it's not an overnight sort of success in anything you set out to do, and that it's okay to, to be weak and vulnerable and admit to being broken sometimes um, can reach that many more people because it resonates. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate you sharing that and uh, sharing it to the world too because it is no easy thing. And it's, it's really nice now, especially as uh, a lot of people, every single person on this earth is being humbled during this t time in 2020. Uh, it gives way to come out with, the things that are humbling you or humbled you before, you know, one person I thought of when you were speaking was Tim Ferriss and mm -hmm. him coming out about his, his, uh, trauma and the fact that he was, um, just really abused and, and raped by, uh, his babysitter is just a terrible thing, but he came out, he had a guide on one of his podcast episodes was a dear friend of his and they talked through it and, it's just no easy thing. So for one, thank you for sharing that. And uh, to the self-love aspect, like what was it? A, it's, it's a gradual process, most definitely. But like, what were some great resources and tools or things that you really like was your sword to help you cut through this field of getting to a better, better place? Sure. I think that 
it's a multi-layered sort of thing and definitely like as i alluded to in my post it's very much not an overnight thing it's not a matter of weeks months yeah. or years there's no timeline on it but i very much give credit to the people that i have around me like having really great people and making sure that you know i i was trusting like if, if i say that i trust and love someone right like i need to actually be showing it i can't just say it and so if i'm not reaching out to them and admitting like i'm kind of in a tailspin right now um you know it's it's not justice to the friendship that we have and the love that we share if i'm just being stubborn and going about it on my own and so mm -hmm. it's it's very much a just trying to be i guess honest with myself when that was happening when i'd catch myself sliding back into bad things of like i'll just fix this by myself and you know i i still do that sometimes like even in the past couple of months um but I'm better, I think, and faster at catching it now earlier on because I, I think like the, the sort of gut instinct I have for it has definitely been able to develop over the years. Um, but I also, you know, surround myself with people who uh, I think, you know, like when you have really close friends, they'll call you on your bullshit. <laughs> so I have never had a great poker face. And so if I am doing something that's like out of character or I disappear for a while or you know, my, I think I just have also really perceptive people around me and I try to do the same for them and just check in and be like, you know, I, I think like we're in polite society where, you know, you'll be like, oh, like, how, how are you doing? And right now that's a pretty loaded question. But oftentimes um, we like following up my friends and I with something that's like, no, but how are you really doing? Or like, how's your heart today? And so kind of cutting past that, that first wall or mask that you might off the cuff do because that's what you do with other people. I think that over the years, um, my friends and I have sort of taught each other to to go further past that and stop having the like shallow conversations and go a lot deeper. So that's, you know, kind of the origin of the question that I like asking people most of the time, which is, you know, what was the last thing that made you smile or laugh today? Mm -hmm. So I can sort of get a gauge on like how they're doing. I can be honest and check in with myself in the moment of like, how am I doing now? Not like an hour ago or two days ago or how I think I'm going to be later today. Like, how am I doing right now? Um, and so I think that that sort of like self reflection and really checking in and connecting with people are like the two top things that I would say, um, when it comes to some internal stuff and external stuff in community. And then I think the other part of it is just really embracing that like creative expression itself is such a huge way of healing for me and mm -hmm. not limiting myself to any sort of medium. Like I really love coming at things with sort of experimental play, but also you know, what makes me the most nervous and excited? Like what isn't going to be comfortable? Like what's actually going to be pushing me to grow? Um, mm -hmm. Which has been super, super fun. Yeah. It, and, and that's, which we'll get into one of the things I queued for today was a uh, flow. And uh, we had a conversation with Oren Davis, Dr. Oren Davis, and he's like an expert on that. And uh, the flow experience, they say you need to challenge yourself a little to uh, really get in that, that experience. So to that point for sure but i really wanted to take the next step into creative surrender studios because you it, it seemed as though which is really beautiful and amazing you created it for the reasons of what happened to you previously to then help others so i would love for you to explain in like your your shortest one sentence what it is but then also what ex what like uh, gatherings have you made that have caused music and arts to transcend these borders and these barriers uh that you just that you guys uh talk about with language barriers or any borders in general yeah for sure so i'd say creative surrender studios itself is a full scale sort of experiential agency um we create bespoke experiences for primarily creatives and entrepreneurs to really get out of their head whatever rut creative or otherwise they might be in and kickstart themselves into bringing that energy into a professional, but also hopefully a creative setting. And so I'd say that's kind of maybe the one sentence thing of it. Um, I think it started in a couple different parts in that we, I knew that like I had already committed to Sundays each week of like, this is my time for me to be creative. Like I'm not moving this on my calendar for anything else. I keep letting this slide. I keep being like, I'm going to say yes to going out with friends, but 
for the like four hours Sunday morning when I woke up, it was for me to do whatever dance to paint to do just do art and like really work on personal projects that had nothing to do with work and so my my friend and I who were ideating on this we kind of decided to invite people into it to have some accountability for ourselves so that was like one part of this mini workshop thing and so that kind of uncapped all of this art and New York being you know a cultural hub of like all this transition of people coming in and out from all these different countries and backgrounds it already was something that went global um, both because myself, I'm like a third culture kid, having grown up a bit all over the place. Yeah. And um, one of my main friends who started this with me, originally being from India and having lived all over parts of the States. So that was one part of it. But I think music really came in because it was this blend of all this stuff I really loved of being around different artists and really, you know, proudly being a music addict and very involved with the So Far Sounds community. Um, wherever I am in the world, I try to meet up with that community. And so it kind of just evolved into sometimes uh, we'd have jam sessions during breaks, during these passion sprints. And so people would end up sharing spoken word, myself included. Uh, people would have their guitar because they were on their way from something else. We had uh, a mutual friend come in who does all these crazy sound baths um, with different like lotus drums, which was super cool. And so it just became this really cool way to you know really choose ourselves and dedicate time to these projects we may have been letting slide and so from there it kind of evolved into these really wonderful things of anything from being parts of different retreats and inviting people into you know what what is that thing that's going to make you scared or nervous or just like really have fun and play so multi-leveled games of sort of a combination of scavenger hunt and trivia and assassin um to the most recent, like, larger scale thing I think we've done to date is the Namaste at Home Festival, which originally originated as an idea I had to do a benefit concert to give back to a community we were staying with in Brazil when I was traveling with all of these other global nomads uh, with the company Hacker Paradise and leading them into these excursions of, hey, let's go on photo walks and dance in the street and, you know, confront the fact that we're all very uncomfortable being on camera and getting candid pictures to... Um, you know, being like, I've met all these incredible musicians and artists as I've been traveling, like, I'd love to just throw a show. But, you know, with the, with the nature of what the pandemic was, and inevitably, once it started hitting Latin America, I knew that, you know, it wasn't going to be a really responsible decision to push through with gathering maybe 100 something people together for this concert. And so I was a little disappointed, because I knew this was, you know, maybe not the right time, maybe I should wait for next year. Um, and that and then when... That would have yeah. been that would have been in Brazil if you did yeah. it. Okay. Yeah, I was I was trying to do it in uh, Florianapolis. Got connected with uh, some friends of friends who are musicians there, and we were uh, we were doing co working at this space that's this really cool epicenter of art and science and digital mediums and everything they do. And so they were probably going to be one of the venues we were considering. And so it was it was you know a bit of a bummer on top of everything else that was happening. And so when you know inevitably COVID was hitting Latin America and countries were closing their borders very rapidly. Um, all of us really had to choose, are we evacuating? Are we going to stay here? This could be, you know, two to three months. This could be six months. And so I ended up coming back to the States and it may, might've been part sleep deprivation, right? Of traveling for over 24 hours on flights, but made it home safely, slept for a night and then woke up the next day and just kind of had this light bulb moment of, I'm no longer tied to a location. And this is a crazy idea, but maybe I could make this into a virtual festival. I have no idea how to do that. Like, I, I kind of will know the logistics, right? We've all been living on Zoom. But, um, you know, I'm just going to reach out to some people and musicians that I know and see if this is something they might say yes to. And pretty much everyone I reached out to said yes, just like let them know the date and what time. So it became this really, really wonderful global thing where in April we had a literal 24-hour festival um, that featured, I think, 44 something artists from 13 different countries across all these different genres. And it went super well. People got to really find music they didn't know they loved yet, which is my goal with any concert I'm trying to MC. And then we ended up doing it again in August and were able to, you know, find that many more musicians to find uh, spoken word really get incorporated this time. And we also got to launch uh, the Namaste at Home Artist Fund, which was new. And 
we were able to donate a hundred percent of the proceeds for that fund back to the artists that performed who really needed it at this time. In addition to supporting some really great organizations and causes that are both international as well as, you know, more local to where some of these artists are from. So all in all, I think it's, we try to like evolve and grow things in a, in a very natural manner, but, you know, really connecting people together across these different mediums and bringing some like light and joy into what's going on as well as support, you know, organizations and causes that are really proven advocates in what they're doing, particularly for those fighting for social injustice across the world, because it is very much a global systemic issue. Those are all things that have always been really important to me. And it's been awesome to figure out a way how to get everything into sort of maybe one event. Yeah. Yeah. And and to that point, interweaving like purpose, uh, impactful actions and stuff you really enjoy doing and then bringing others together very much a connector for that reason so it's cool to see it organically grow into its own and uh and the fact that you can navigate during this time with still keeping it afloat uh what do you like in particular for yourself like for creating music and what uh, instruments or what things really evokes because i've seen on your website it can be photography, painting, spoken word. You have some great stuff on there. What do you, is it, is it just that? Um, and then also what instruments do you play? Uh, Cause I always do find that interesting, but yeah. Sure. Um, I think part of why I am this like multi hyphenated artist type person is because I'm just really curious and like experimenting with things, but my parents, um, I think tried to keep us so busy that we never had time to get in trouble, which I really do appreciate now um, because, you know, we did everything from (laughs) gymnastics to um, we had to play instruments to doing some martial arts and, you know, all this emphasis on academics and sports. And so for me, um, this was kind of a way of rebelling of like, I just want to like try everything. I'm really curious. So there were a lot of different things that I've, I've loved sort of diving into over the years and have continued to do because depending on how I'm feeling, maybe like a different medium is a great way of expressing this one time or this season that I might be in, but maybe it won't work for me and I'll feel kind of blocked in another time. So how else can I kind of get myself out of that rut? But for music in particular, I think um, I always struggled with it. I feel like that's the one medium of creativity that um, when it involves so much time for for practice and often sitting still and focusing. Um, it wasn't something that I super connected with, but I did play piano and guitar uh, when I was still in middle school, which was super fun. And I'm, I can kind of still pick stuff up. But I think I was always more drawn to the melodies that were being created, as well as the lyricism and the story behind what a lot of these artists were getting into, which is probably why when I MC or moderate anything, I always have a ton of questions for people. Um, I really want to hear about their story. And so it was, I guess, in a way, I just really loved being around music and seeing the process of how it all comes to be created and getting to the origins of like what it really means and chatting lyrics and understanding how people have these different processes. I I think like, you know, sometimes people are like, I have, you know, one favorite place that I love writing. It always inspires me or I have to put on this kind of music to inspire me when I'm doing this thing or I met this person and it just sparked something really wonderful. And so that was part of it, I think. And then the other was that I kind of have music ADHD um, in that my cousin and I used to send each other music back and forth um, when what was it called? I think this was the site called Pure Volume, which had all of these indie rock alternative groups that melded all these different genres together. We used to send each other stuff back and forth all the time and go to live shows, spent summers at like Warp Tour. um, And just always trying to surround myself with music was a good way to balance out that it wasn't maybe something I was super drawn to being like hands on with instruments. Mm -hmm. But I love getting to geek out about music. Yeah, the story for sure. What what songs and uh, things resonate with you now that that others can probably uh, link up with and know of? Yeah, um, so I think my my tastes are very varied. My friends laugh because if you get me started on like K-pop in particular, I'm so so happy that that is really something that has transcended country borders. Right, um, it's been something I've been very passionate about since early high school. 
And it was not the cool thing to be passionate about. Like I was super into BBSK. I kept up with everything with Big Bang. And so getting to see artists like BTS, like Blackpink, like NCT, and a plethora of others really starting to cross into other markets has been such a wonderful thing to see. Um, And I love BTS in particular because I think beyond the level of production quality and the involvement that they have as artists and what they're producing, the message of what they're doing has always been really about getting their fans, their their like army to really love themselves, to talk about taboo topics of depression, of really supporting like the LGBTQ plus community um, and really kind of pushing the borders of, of what's possible. And I don't think it's really just like K-pop as a genre at all anymore. Like they have some really incredible ballads in there. It's not just a lot of like synths and techno and crazy choreography, like that's all part of it. But so there's that lens of it. And then I think the other is um, I really like when I'm dancing, I'd say my style is a combination of hip hop and contemporary. So anything with some really cool melodic like synths is probably my jam. But Mm -hmm. I I go and find new artists all the time, especially if they're ones that I've met uh, via so far or some of my other friends who are musicians who are recommending things. Um, So I think it's, Usually I know within the first like 30 seconds to the minute of the song, if I'm like, this is it, like I'm going to have this on repeat all week. Um, (laughs) So that's always really fun. Yeah. If if there's stuff that sticks, it's always on repeat for sure. Someone I really, really love a lot recently is J. Cole. I mean, I've always liked him, but Mm -hmm. stuff is just, just speaks, just speaks volumes. Um, Did you talk to Mariana about J. Cole? No, I didn't. I should have. Oh my gosh. You, um, <laughs> if you didn't talk about music with her, you need to circle back because she's like one of my friends who we just vibe out. We used to paint together and just listen to music yeah, well, for hours. So yeah, good. For, for context, uh, for those listening, Mariana will be, I'm not sure what episode, but she's, uh, was on the podcast. We talked and there was one instance, um, what I brought, I referenced cause we talked a week before recording and she was painting, uh, I think it was a fish, and then listening to a quantum mechanics lecture or like quantum physics lecture. And it's just, and the same thing applies. She could have been listening to music, but I find that, uh, I find that the fact that it evokes certain creativity in you guys is a cool element of just creating in general. And I was, I was actually going to ask you on that same page, you've connected so many people, you, you've, had communities come together the stuff you've done with creative surrender studios namaste at home all that what really evokes like what are practices that evoke and i know it's subjective for each person but what are practices that evoke creativity in people that you found yeah i think some of it is um still having i guess like a container for spontaneity so that's part of why i think passion prints have been something that resonates with people because they're forced to make time and they don't have to keep track of time themselves. Like I keep track of it for them. But when you're, you're in that sort of container, you then can break out of it and be spontaneous because you've chosen to dedicate time to the craft that you're creating. And so doing that with some sort of routine, whether it's weekly or daily is super, super powerful in and of itself. And I guess for me in particular, if I'm doing that first thing in the morning, that sets up the rest of my day, the rest of my week, like my entire month, because I'm so like focused in getting whatever it is out that I need to get out first thing in the morning. And so oftentimes that very first thing that I do is, you know, whatever morning routine stuff, I'll brush my teeth, but I'll usually end up dancing at like 6 a.m. And then after that, I'll like sit down, I'll journal, I might have like a smoothie or drink water or something, but I'm just like getting stuff out for whatever I might be carrying. So I don't have to carry it with me the rest of the day. And also I have a really bad problem sitting still. So it gets out some of my energy, but I think like being, I guess, that intentionality piece again, of, of everything I've been saying so far, like I, I really do like choose myself in those moments and like the artist within me to like, you know, spend that time with myself before I get started with the rest of the day. Yeah. Before, before you do anything, like you don't check the phone or any of that. 
Um, <laughs> no, I definitely check my phone uh, okay. because my, my alarm will go off and I'll yeah, see a yeah, notification. Yeah, sure. But um, yeah, I do try to stay off of it for the first couple hours of the day as much as I possibly can. But uh, given that, you know, I, I definitely have people and I consider family from all around the world. Uh, I usually wake up with some sort of group message that's been pinging off during the night while I've been asleep and need to respond to it. So usually I'll answer a couple things in the morning, but what? never completely offline. Yeah. And what are the passion sprints you, you referenced? Like just a short form of how that works when you do the creative surrender stuff uh, at the gatherings or just in general with people? Sure. So we originally used to do them on either Saturday or Sunday every week, and they were in person in New York. And so if you're familiar with sort of Pomodoro sprints, normally it's really short, dedicated sprints with maybe a 15 minute break in between. Um, but you have like dedicated time and you're on a timer. And so we kind of adapted it to give a little bit more time. So rather than say 45 minutes, it's for an hour, we'll still do like a 10 to 15 minute break in between. But we're really intentional at the breaks of like checking in the chat with the other people that are there seeing how we can support each other and what we're doing. And then, you know, we'll throw in something that's unexpected. So maybe someone there is really into tarot and wants to give a tarot reading or someone wants to lead a meditation or my favorite if you haven't picked up i really love movement and dance will be like let's have a dance break or like who wants to lead some sort of stretch thing because i know that say this person that's attending has like yoga training experience and could just lead us through something really wonderful and their voice is super soothing and so it becomes this really great kind of collaborative thing even as we all come together and might be working on completely different things across different industries but in a sort of creative lens um, I'd say that's what it is in a nutshell. It's usually for um, like three to so three or so hours. Um, so we usually do like three sprints within that. I see. I see. And someone I really have experienced that from, uh, and I, I think you know of her as Sarah Gaines. Mm -hmm. She she did this thing called Joy Flow, and uh, it was really interesting seeing uh, the the barriers that come down when you do that. And it makes so much sense too, right? Like I, I was, I was out to dinner the other week and even if there were no drinks or wine involved, dancing just sort of like eventually it gets people out of their own way. And that's always the goal, right? It's just getting out of your own way so you can create without overthinking or judging yourself. Super. Yeah, absolutely. I'm um, I'm going through uh, The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron right now for the first time. There's uh, 16 or 17 other artists that I'm doing it with, some of whom have done it before, but maybe not in 20 years, some who did it a year ago, some who are like me and have never done it before or they attempted to and didn't get very far on their own. Um, but one of the things that we've all really been talking about is uh, how much sometimes you get in your own way and you're your own worst enemy and self-sabotaging some of the stuff that you know that you want to do, but for whatever reason, um, you know, you're, you're not doing it. And so it's really digging into like, why is that happening? Yeah. Yeah. And what, since you're going through, what have, what are some things that have glaringly came out that, that you're getting in your way with maybe a little bit, maybe it's a little bit now cause you're so aware of yourself, but just even a little bit. Um, I think something that had fallen off for me for the beginning of quarantine was Julia Cameron's really big on uh, morning pages. So really journaling in the morning, writing, handwriting, if you can, like three pages and just getting it out and not reading it again. This is literally just for you to get it all out. And so I had done that without realizing um, because I'd say starting last June, I was like, I'm going to write a journal entry every day for an entire year. I used to do this like you know, for sporadic, maybe weeks or months at a time, but like, I've never done it for that long. And so it was really great for me to do it um, as part of my like, morning routine, I was kind of revamping. Um, but I'd still say that's probably the best thing. Because I when I started traveling again, and then got home, it was just like, time is what is time anymore, right? It's this thing that's exists between snacks, or I don't really know what day it is. Sometimes it depends on what's going on that day. And so Figuring out that this is how I'm sort of marking time um, has been really cool to see. And the things that I'm coming up with, even though I don't go back and like read them, I know are coming up for me and sort of the intentions I'm, I guess, putting out into the universe. And for me and uh, Mariana and a lot of our other friends, like we're really big on, you know, 
cool. Like we're talking about our dreams, but how do we actually go and manifest them into the world? How do the things that we do really impact the world for the better? And how does this stuff all ripple out and how do we make it sustainable? Um, so I think it's just like really recognizing through the artist way that like, I always have been called to be an artist. When people ask me what I am, like artist is usually the first thing that I'll say. As much as I'm not a huge fan of any sort of labels or definitions, like I know that that's something that like I was born to be and to really be able to spark that sort of creativity in other people. Mm, for sure. Manifesting, loading, loading in the manifesting category. <laughs> <laughs> and, ta and talking about morning pages and writing, um, super profound uh which is a huge achievement when it comes at the end of the year whenever it happens you're going to be uh releasing a book so yes yes i please, am <laughs> <laughs> talk about talk about like the process it's scary challenging good i'm sure it's all of them and a little bit about creative surrender the book and and what's in there Sure. Well, uh, Creative Surrender is going to be the first book that I'm publishing. It's uh, nonfiction. It's partly the story of how Creative Surrender as a studio came to be. Um, dives back into sort of childhood, the, day, the early days of stageless art and how that kind of expanded globally to be something that was on and off in 12 cities worldwide, um, just by word of mouth. Um, it's about kind of really digging into those struggles and, and sort of being vulnerable and really giving some gratitude for those super hard moments. Like, I think it's really easy to celebrate the wins, but being able to celebrate those failures too is something that I definitely still struggle with. I know a lot of people are like, I'd rather just, you know, push this under the rug and forget about it. But, you know, it's not something that you have to really carry with you, but it is something that will kind of inform how you're going about your day, what energy you're bringing into any sort of conversation, into your friendships, into your relationship, even with your family. And kind of what that process is like of healing with, uh, I guess, like more intentionality, but through really surrendering to like what the creative process is, which is it's never a like straight line anywhere. Um, and, yeah. you know, there's there's definitely like waves and peaks to to what kind of comes out of it and that that's totally OK. So I'm really excited. It's um incredibly scary to even be admitting it to something like this on a podcast um, because this is something that I wrote the first draft of for NaNoWriMo last November which is National Novel Writing Month and there were some friends and I who were all like we're all gonna write like the first draft of whatever it is we're writing blog posts or a novella or whatever it might be and I was like I'm gonna write this book and I think uh, myself and one of my friends Matt were the only two in our group to actually finish our drafts and we just kept going back and forth every day of like, I'm at this word count. And so we were just like, it's a mini competition. Like we both want to win. So we ended up both finishing on the last day. And it was just this like huge thing of relief, but also realizing like, wow, you can, I can write an entire book in 30 days. Like, and again, that small thing, I think even with morning pages, with doing stuff with a, any sort of routine or frequency, it really does show you like how much can happen in very small steps. And it's really like when you break it down into sort of day by day or week by week thing, it's a lot more manageable for your brain to kind of wrap around. And you'll see like results happen maybe faster than you ever think it will. And so I think maybe that's the other part of doing the artist way. There's this huge acceleration momentum I feel like I now have um, even though I feel like I've been going at full speed, like all of quarantine, <laughs> but um, it's been, it's been really cool to see that happen. And, you know, I did light edits maybe uh, in the fall of last year, but then, you know, life happened. I was packing up to leave New York and then I was supposed to be traveling the world for about a year for a new company. And then that all kind of got derailed. And so it was only in the last uh, month, month and a half that I really started digging back into it because I was like, I wrote this entire thing and I'm afraid of putting it out there. And, you know, does this need to say the light of day? <laughs> yeah. Um, sorry, what was that? Which means you should do it. If it's exactly. Yeah. Um, which is what I've taught myself from being like, okay, I'm afraid of, you know, dancing in public outside of dance events or like stepping out from behind the camera. So like, I, I guess that was, you know, this is all in the book. So if anyone wants to hear about or go find the video of me dancing in a red panda onesie in Singapore at like 6.30 in the morning when it was 90 degrees outside, like that was something that scared the hell out of me. And filming all of that for a friend's music video and EP he was releasing was just like nuts. Um, but there are all these, I think, really wonderful moments of like what what's on the other side of this fear. And so I know like, putting this book out there, I know one, it'll resonate with people because any of my friends, I've read parts of it too, have 
cried, which I, I'm taking as a good thing. Um, <laughs> they've said it's a good thing, um, yeah. that it's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a great writer. And I think the other thing is that I've been having a lot of conversations with other writers about, you know, what is, what are all our perspectives? What is this time that we're all living in going to say about us? And if it's not out there for people to like read or watch or, or get to really see, that's such a disservice to like what you're really creating right now. And so we, we've been talking a lot, I guess, about, you know, what's, what do we want to be in the libraries of the future when historians are putting together textbooks for kids to learn from at this time, where are they going to be pulling those sources from? If it's not out there and accessible for people, then that story is inevitably going to get lost. Maybe only parts of it are by word of mouth or secondhand accounts. But, um, you know, all of that, I think, has gotten wrapped up in the tail end of, of the book edits, of, of what that journey has kind of been and coming back full circle to that. Of I, wrote, I started writing this November 1st of 2019, and I'm aiming at publishing it at the end of this month in October, so a little mm -hmm. under a year from when I was working on it. Yeah, I, I appreciate you sharing all that. And Cheers to first ever book release and just going back to it too. Cause I was going to say, it's probably so you talk about creative surrender. It's probably so liberating to have your, most of your story down on paper and explaining your whole journey. I mean, you're right. People can do them a disservice if they don't have it documented in some form and writing is the most potent usually. So that's, that's powerful. Excited to see it. Thanks. I'm, I'm excited it's coming out. I just did uh, something else that I was like, my heart was beating so fast on and that again, I've learned to ask for help now. It's, it's very much a process, but yeah. um, I've been told it gets easier the more you do it uh, by one of my closest friends, Amela. And so uh, I was like, okay, in that spirit, I should really stop procrastinating on reaching out to my friends who keep telling me they want to beta read my book for me. <laughs> <laughs> and so I texted a bunch of them yesterday um, and pretty much everyone immediately was like, yes. And they're like, you're like way too nice in how you ask. You sent me a really long text being like, here's the, the time I'm going to give you the thing. And here's when I need feedback by on this date. And, you know, I totally get there's a lot of stuff going on right now. So one, like, do you have the bandwidth during this time frame? And like, do you want to do this? It, it, it's even only like one chapter. And they were all like, oh my gosh, like, thank you for asking me and like letting us support you. And I was like, okay, clearly, clearly I should be um, reaching out to you guys more on things. And they're like, yeah, we know that you're like moving at a gazillion mile per hour and you like got it all down, but like, you know, we want to be here yeah, for yeah, you. Yeah, so yeah. yeah, even doing that yesterday, I was like, oh, self growth. I'm proud of myself. <laughs> Claps for that. Celebrate the small wins. That's good. And, and the one thing I, uh, I was going to bring up before that I just mm -hmm. want to know is I thought of like this thing of creative surrender and flow and, and it's just, like just being in this experience we always want to be, not really a state because it'll make sense when I say this, but I thought of how flow and this creativity, it's more of like, this river you enter and not really a mountain you climb. Um, mm -hmm. And I just think it's like, if, if people can get that in their heads, that it's always available. Like you can always go into it. Um, it is on and off, but it's like, it's always there. It's all around us. So you're someone who's embodying that. And it's really cool with the book, with all of your work to see that happening and uh, self growth in real time. Um, but nonetheless, I, I wanted to, I guess I was going to say, what do you, aspiring to do what are you looking forward to but the book is is that in in a nutshell for sure but i other than that i wanted to leave the door open for anything else top of mind or anything you wanted to mention before uh, we cap this this discussion sure well um and they thank you again for having me and, and for the life chat it's it's been fun and i definitely want to hear more from you next time about everything that you're looking forward to but i think um i'll cap it off by uh saying that I think there's, a, again, a lot of power in writing things down and, um, and sharing it with people because something that actually, Mariana is going to be like, you mentioned me way too much, but she's, sure. she's really one of my closest friends. Um, mid last December of 2019, we were all hanging out at her place and a bunch of us all wrote down a manifestation letter or list to ourselves of all the things we wanted to accomplish by this day and time next year. So this coming December. And I wrote down things on it that I was like, I don't know how I'm going to do this. I'm going to be traveling. Like this is sort of not a high priority for me. 
Um, but I went back and I found it a couple weeks ago and hadn't looked at it since December. I think I had 15 things down and I'd done 10.5 of them. And so I think there's so much power in doing it because even if you're not intentionally like surface level thinking about it, like you've written it down, you've put it out there, you've kind of clarified for yourself what's going to be coming out in the world. And so the three things that I have left are things that I've already been in progress on and have been uh, healing stuff with the relationships in family and friends that you know, have been really broken, but I really wanted to reconnect with. It's publishing this book and it's, you know, continuing to do a lot of stuff with Creative Surrenders as a studio. So that's different um, panels coming up of chatting with different like creatives and entrepreneurs and bringing them together to talk about, you know, what is creative thinking and critical thinking during this time, because there's so many different ways to come about and tackle different challenges we're seeing in the industries we work in or in our relationships with friends and family. Um, there's a lot of different cool things that I'm super excited about, but I can't talk about quite yeah. yet. Yeah, um, but there's, there's a lot going on and it's, it's stuff I'm really, really excited for. And I just, um, I have a lot, a lot of gratitude again, the same way that uh, my post we started off talking about in the episode today was that I would not have made it nearly as far without some of these people that I've had around me and they've impacted me um, so much in really getting to step into my own power and see like, you know, who it is I want to become, because I've always tried to step into each day of being like, okay, I'm going to be the person that I needed when I was younger. And being able to do that for other people, especially ones who are just getting started or are really self-doubting themselves still. I'm like, I'm, I'm not creative. Like, I couldn't do what you do. And I have to bring them back to, literally, I could never public speak. It, like, made me feel like I was going to puke. And I had a teacher who identified that I was a great writer and an artist from painting to poetry and she made all of us in our class junior year get up and give a spoken word poem and I did one on racial stereotypes and she stood up and applauded and was like you need to keep doing this and so being that kind of like encouragement for people to be like I don't know I've always joked that I've been like the proudest parent at the PTA meeting about what my friends are doing but being able to be that for someone even if like I don't know them well quite yet. Like I know we're going to be really good friends. I know they're capable of so, so much. And so having that kind of energy around you, um, it, like pushes you so, so far because you can't help but be inspired by who else is around you. And you know, that ends up being this really wonderful cycle in return. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, super grateful. I, I, there's not much else to say or it'll, it'll <laughs> subdue all that was just said. So thank you. Um, We'll definitely talk, but uh, yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Anthony. Have right. you a great rest of the day and, you know, sending you all the sunshine and hugs from San Francisco right now. Thanks. I appreciate it. Have a good rest of your day.